Mitch Daniels is the former governor, still governor until uh, January, uh, of the great state of Indiana. He was born in Pennsylvania of a Syrian grandfather, moved to Indiana, uh, then became an aide to uh, Mayor Richard Lugar, then Senator Richard Lugar, then was in private sector, and then um, became the director of the Office of Management and Budget uh, for President Bush, 43. In 2004, he went back to Indiana and he ran for governor, having never had elective office, and guess what, he won. Uh, he, tr he went across the state on an RV uh, and stayed in people's homes, something that he continues to do uh, when he's going throughout his state. Uh, and somebody said that he was physically focused, budget cutting, pragmatic thinking, wonky, slightly stiff, pro-business, a funny guy, motorcycle riding, pork eating, good governor of Indiana. Uh, that's what they said about him, and he still rides a motorcycle. He also uh, has been out front in terms of what we have to do in terms of our issues of the, of the debt and economic issues, and also how he ran the state of Indiana. Uh, they still have unemployment issues, but at the same time, they have a, a AAA credit rating uh, and business is coming to Indiana. He has just taken the job of president of Purdue. For many of us, we thought it would be another president that he might be seeking. Um, and so my question really is not why didn't he do that, uh, but why did you take the job of the president of a university uh, with all your experience uh, and what happens if a presidential nominee comes to you and says, I need a running mate? Uh, and you cannot refuse the opportunity to serve your country. Well, the answer to the second question is no, it won't happen. But if it did, uh, I'm, I'm spoken for and I made it very, very plain. The Purdue decision yeah. eliminates that possibility. Commitment is a commitment. Is a commitment. And, and the answer to the first question, I, I probably will be uh, trying to resolve for myself for a long time, Charlie, but uh, in my wise guy moment when a mutual friend of ours called and said, what? I said, look, President of the United States looked too easy. I wanted a challenging job, like <laughs> president of a university. And, uh, uh, but I know it'll, uh, as Monty Python used to say, now for something completely different. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to the adventure. I'm also remembering that, it's, at least maybe it's apocryphal, but supposedly when Woodrow Wilson went the other way from president of a university to governor of New Jersey, and they asked him why, he said, I couldn't stand the politics anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but you've enjoyed a, pu a public life, going from a staff guy to a public guy, to an elected guy. Yeah, right. I've been in and out. Uh, I've been in two White Houses, and, uh, and, uh, but then a long stretch in the private sector in between, all three sectors of society. Ran a nonprofit research, contract research organization for a while, and um, in you know, my own notion, and I think it's a great beauty of our system, is that it makes room for people to come and go from public life and, and bring their uh, experiences and different perspectives with them. My own view has always been, I, I admire some people who make a life of it, but I never intended to, and always told the people in my state that uh, I was going to give them four, the job for, I hoped, eight years of the best work I could, and then go back and live under the laws I'd been part of. Passing. States are a laboratory for reform, are they not? They are. It's a, a great phrase. I think Justice Brandeis maybe, but anyway, very apt phrase. When, steal it wherever I can find it. Where, where, uh, so do governors, by the way. That, that really one of the, the part of the, I think, uh, uh, genius of the federal system is uh, it's, a, uh, it's uh, uh, a natural place for plagiarism and uh, uh, good ideas, travel. And bad ideas are exposed and uh, tend not to be replicated. It has a self-correcting mechanism built in. I think we're seeing it now. We see it on, in all eras, probably. But uh, you know, states that uh, make bad choices um, uh, sooner or later are, uh, will uh, their citizens will decide to excuse the people who made those and invite someone else to try something different. States are affected by what happens at the federal level, having to do uh, with decisions that Congress makes, as well as. Uh, decisions that the Supreme Court makes. What did you think of the decision that came down on health care, uh, and what does it mean for the states? I was surprised, as I think virtually all people were, by the nature of the decision. But um, now at least we know. And uh, there are big implications, particularly because uh, 
something I was glad to see, the, the court uh, reaffirming the uh, role of the states by saying that the, the indirect coercion of, of, Medi of the Medicaid portions of the bill. The states cannot be penalized. That's right, that uh, it has to be optional. And that'll create a big decision for each state on top of the decision whether to try to run one of these exchanges or let the federal government uh, try their hand at it. And with respect to the Commerce Clause saying that uh, there was a majority saying, and the Chief Justice was part of that, you know, said that the Commerce Clause cannot be used for an expansion of congressional power. Right. I wish, wish there had been more than five votes. I think it's, it was so important to establish. If we are a nation of laws, uh, then uh, the fundamental law of this republic has got to mean something. And it was written uh, to enumerate powers, and it was written to draw a boundary line around government. There has to be a boundary somewhere. And the, the question the government never was able to answer um, in this whole endeavor was, if the government can do that, federal government, then what can it not do? And uh, they got all tongue-tied every time somebody raised that. But in, is it, why do you think Justice Roberts made the decision he did to be part of the majority uh, and in a sense kick it back to the political process? I can't psychoanalyze um, Justice oh, Roberts. Just guess. Yeah. Well, I think I, I, I am persuaded by the very eloquent guesses uh, of, or assessments of, of other people. Uh, Charles Krauthammer is one who, who believe, and it seems to, to jibe with the facts, that uh, the Chief Justice and, uh, and others also wanted to uh, uh, protect the court and, uh, over, for the long haul. And um, frankly, to leave room, you know, legislatures have to be able to make mistakes. I happen to think they made a mistake here, but we'll t time will tell. So I, I believe that he, I, I believe that assessment is makes more sense to me than uh, than any, any other that I've seen. And I just want to say that I have wished for a long, long time that uh, we could we had never got into this position into this position of people rather loosely looking at the Supreme Court as though we're just another partisan legislature or something, referring to everybody as by labels and even party labels. Uh, I don't think the justices, whatever their views, think of themselves that way, and I hope one day as a citizenry we'll stop thinking of them. Well, I read what Krauthammer said, and he suggested that perhaps Justice Roberts wanted to avoid some of the criticism that came from Bush versus Gore, which was taken in some quarters as a political decision. Right. I mean, we, we, need, a, we need a court which is uh, non-political. I think we probably have one, but we've been treating it as though it were. I guess that's what I'm saying. And if this decision, whatever its merits, whatever we decide about it 10 or 20 years from now, uh, does nothing else, I hope it will s say to a, a lot of Americans, hey, you know, these are people who are trying their very best to apply the law of the land the best they understand it. When you look at um, the country today, what ought to be uh, the debate in this upcoming election, in your judgment, and how pivotal is this election? Um, hard, uh, pivotal, yes. Uh, no it's more significant than the previous election. No, much more so. It's 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 said every election year, uh, uh, but uh, this time it's probably true. And 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 I say that not as a uh, a matter of uh, policy judgment; it's a matter of arithmetic. You know, the issue in this election is, will we remain a self-governing people? Do we have the capacity, as, as, a, as, a, as the citizens of a free republic, uh, to uh, discipline ourselves in the interest of the future? Uh, we are administering an incredible shafting to the young people of this country. We are handing them debts that cannot possibly be repaid already before we make them any worse. The, the law that is now going to become the law of the land is going to multiply the premiums, insurance premiums, paid by young people in my state by three to four times, uh, just adding to a generational injustice. Now, I don't know very many Americans. Most Americans just don't see that. No one in public life has successfully communicated to them the nature of what we're doing. I happen to believe that most Americans would, would uh, absolutely support a constructive prescription that says, no, that's not what we intended. We want to turn over an America that is better than the one we found. And uh, we want our children to have opportunities beyond those we had. Uh, but do you think it's a good idea for everybody to have access to health care? And do you think it's a good idea for people in 
uh, for pre-existing conditions to be able to get insurance? Um, of, of course. And, you know, a, a, among many confusions in this area, Americans have access to health care. The way we pay for it, the way we insure ourselves is a little klutzy and could stand a lot of improvement. I don't think, personally, that the um, approach of this particular bill is the right way to go. It takes the worst features, the most cost, costly and inefficient features of the current system and makes them even larger. I would have preferred a rate, more, a, a way more consumerist um, and, and frankly one that gives greater credit to the decision-making ability of individual citizens, does not treat them as hapless uh, victims uh, who couldn't possibly make a smart choice for themselves. And I won't take the audience's time, but uh, in our state, we have one of the biggest uh, experiments, if you want, in uh, self-directed health care in the country. Every state employee, or 94 percent of our state employees, and everybody in an insurance plan we created for the near poor is in a, effectively a, a health savings account. And guess what? They can make very wise, prudent decisions about their own health care, just like people in this audience. Uh, do you felt? Uh, so, so with respect to what uh, Congressman Ryan has proposed, do you think that's a wise way? Some kind of voucher system, uh, which he calls a premium. Yeah, I think that heads down the right path. Let's let's ensure uh, with with. Uh, uh, high priority to the uh, lowest income citizens, special uh, priority to those with uh, uh, acute health care problems or, uh, or uh, pre-existing conditions, uh, if you will, um, and let's empower them to make choices for themselves. Let's make sure that those choices are available and, and uh, you know, let the market work. Where we've tried that, it has tended to lead to uh, positive outcomes. Does Medicare work? Not very well. Uh, not as well as it could. I don't know. Well, let's let's define work. You know, d does it work? Um, you, you know, people get care, um, but at an extraordinary cost. Uh, does it work as well as it could? I, uh, my my view is no. It could work far better. Uh, okay, it could work better in terms of what way? I mean, is it, I mean, you could re you could change the fee-based system, but everybody wants to do that, don't they? I don't know if everybody wants to do that. You I mean, know, the, 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 when I look at health care, if we had tried to design a system, Charlie, to uh, 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 run up costs, and, and which in inevitably impinges on care, we couldn't have done much better than what we have. We, we uh, pay people for the quantity of what they do, not the quality of their work. We make it appear free to the recipient. So of course, people ask for as much as, as they uh, uh, can, as they can. Uh, we, uh, just to make sure it costs too much, we have a legal system that runs riot and, and uh, uh, produces no socially valuable outcome for the extra costs it imposes. And so why should we be surprised that uh, it's 18, 19 percent of our uh, economy no, when, of our it, GDP. when it probably could be much less? Largest sector of our economy. So when you look at, at, at this election, what, what is it, what's your criticism of President Obama? Now, Charlie, you know I've taken a vow of celibacy. Yes, I know. But you can be celibate con and still consistent with, explore around the edges, consistent can't you? with my new... Well, I'm not going to criticize anybody here. But, but I, I mean, you yeah, have but, called it in what yeah. you have said on the record. He believes in trickle-down economy uh, and triple-down economy, uh, and he believes in statism, and that if he's re-elected, we will see statism run rampant. That's what you've said, to, uh, approximately. L let me just say, uh, leaving the the candidates out of it for a minute, that I think that, yeah, okay. the, the, that they the imperative that I would hope uh, uh, Americans who disagree sincerely about so many other questions ought to come together around is this. Uh, if the private sector of this economy does not begin to grow much faster than it is, school is out. I don't care what your preference is. If you believe in limited government, as I do, or very a, more, a much more active and expansive and expensive government, as many people do, um, uh, 1.9 is not going to cut it. If we're going to pay the bills we've already piled up, if we're going to pay for um, e extensions of what government does, like the new health care plan, then we, we ought to be calling every close one and breaking every tie in favor of a private sector that grows much more rapidly uh, till further notice, and that's probably years off. And so when I look... But, but the private yeah. sector is sitting on 
uh, a, a lot of money they're not investing. So uh, why aren't they investing and what is it, the economy and what should, the, what should take place in order for the private sector to start investing their money that they have plenty of and can borrow plenty of? We had to hit the pause button on an avalanche of regulation that's already happened or is scheduled to happen. Nobody even knows what it is, so uh, uh, everybody's learned the word uncertainty in recent uh, years, and it's, a, and it's a very material factor. We ought to absolutely, I think, optimize on the energy. The, the, you know, Yankee ingenuity has come through for us again. Um, and this is, of course, an important lesson of, of history. Every time uh, people, you know, from Malthus on down, uh, predicted doom and gloom, they overlooked the discontinuous change generally that technology brings. One reason I'm so excited about going to Purdue University, which is one place where breakthrough technologies come from. And uh, so it's happened again. Uh, and uh, this time it wasn't in the exotic worlds of silicon or biotech, but in the old-fashioned world of energy extraction. And all the equations are different in the last three years about how, what the reserves are and what the right. cost of getting them out is. And this is the best break our economy and the world have gotten in a long time. And it may very well make the United States energy independent from the Middle East. And bring in income to people who need it, jobs of the middle class kind that we want. I'm from the most manufacturing intensive state in the country proud to say, we make things in Indiana. And there is no single variable more important than affordable, reliable energy. So low natural gas prices and, and perhaps uh, affordable electricity related to that, huge possible uh, positive. I, all I'm saying is, in that situation, we ought to kick out all the jams. And Are you suggesting regulations stand in the way uh, of this moving forward? Is this a shocking concept? <laughs> yeah. Well, we had well, I'm asking. A, yeah, the, the answer is yes, of course. And well, in every case? Regulation and anything that adds to the cost of hiring somebody right now, as, as taxes do, as regulation, un, you know, indisputably does, we ought to really be examining. This is not for a moment to denigrate the uh, priorities that, uh, of the next, you know, environmental uh, improvement or the next uh, control on financial institutions or any of that. It's just to say that right now we all share, every one of us, an incredible um, stake in an economy that grows faster, that, that restores hope. Weren't you going to wave that around? Oh, I'll get to that. Huh? No, I'll get to that. Well, when you do, this yeah. is the point I'm trying to make. If the American dream right. is, uh, is going to remain alive, then uh, uh, it, it has got to start with a top priority on the, uh, on the engine that pays the bills. All right, I'm not going to wait. Uh, this is Walter's favorite magazine. It's called Time. Uh, they did a co thing called The Making of America Issue, The History of the American Dream, uh, written by the former editor of Newsweek, John Meacham. It is called Is It Still Real? And that's what I was going to say uh, at the end of this conversation. Do you believe the American dream is still real? Charlie, I do, but, you know, but it's fragile in a way that it hasn't been. And, uh, and, and, and it's a really important question that people are, are asking because, you know, call them animal spirits, uh, what, what you like, right. but whether people believe in the dream is going to be one factor, along with all these policies we're just debating here, in whether the dream uh, remains uh, 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 alive and, and functioning. And now I, I, I absolutely do uh, believe it is uh, there's not a country on earth I think that we would want to trade places right. with. Yes, we've got problems. They are, they are more solvable than our political class on either side, I believe. Uh, then why aren't we solving them? Well, you're part of the governing elite. <laughs> well, in my, in my soon-to-be past life, I've, I've expressed in various uh, media, uh, including a book, uh, just exactly why I think um, there is a, a, a non-painful, successful way forward. My confidence, I can't prove it, but I, I, have, I, I have some basis for believing this based on my last eight years experience. In our state, we have, I, I'm not equating the dimension of the problem or, the, uh, or even its nature, but we came into a mess. We have leveled with the people of our state you can tell them the plain facts. You can say we can't do everything for everybody all at the same time. Doesn't mean your idea is not an important one. Just means okay. it may have to wait a while in the interest of us all. But and 
live to tell about it. Okay, it's fair enough, and you, you have done that in, in terms of cutting budgets, and, and you've also, in Indiana, uh, in a sense, done a significant, uh, made significant policy positions on public unions, which you do not believe should be, um, should, should have a role. Correct. Well, I stand in an interesting lineage there. FDR and George Meany and others right. said exactly the same thing. I, I, uh, I do believe there's a fundamental uh, difference, dichotomy between the private and the public sector. And all over America, we're seeing the um, unhappy consequences of, uh, of, uh, of government becoming, in essence, its own special interest sitting on both sides of the table at a table the, the taxpayer doesn't get to sit at. So, you know. Yeah. Charlie, you and I, you reminded me that sometimes I say, I, I, I believe that both the um, most responsible approach to uh, elections like the one we're about to have, and frankly, an efficacious one, at least from my experience, is to campaign to govern, not simply to be elected. Indeed. Let, can I just interrupt you on that? Because you said it even in a different way. Uh, the question is, what advice would you have for Governor Romney? And you basically said, if Governor Romney thinks that he can win by not being Obama, that's the wrong way to go. That what he should run to govern, not to win. And he ought to lay out to the country what he wants to do, rather than simply indicting the president. And that's the kind of debate in which both candidates ought to say, because in your particular case, you know, the issue of the debt and the deficit uh, will ruin us of our future, will deny us our future. Now, Larry just had some questions about that and basically said, if we don't have growth uh, and, and, and in the immediate future, then we'll be in a very bad place too. And if we yeah. just cut and, and reduce the deficit uh, alone without looking after and our education and looking at infrastructure, we'll be in a bad place. We have to do all these things and, and, and more boldly than, than uh, most people have, have suggested so far. Uh, but you have to eat this elephant, you know, one bite at a time, and I'm just eager to see us get started. Yes, we have to have an all-out growth uh, uh, program. Uh, we didn't talk about tax reform here, but that's something I see agreement. You know, I bet Larry Summers and I agree pretty darn closely on the basic elements of, of tax Which reform. Which ought to be, in the broadest sense. Far fewer um, uh, exemptions and exceptions. Which would add to rates. revenue. Yeah, and by the way... So revenue is not sacrosanct. You're not one of those people who says... Don't worry about the revenue side. We can't look at that. We only have to look at cutting entitlements no, no. in order to get to the deficit. No, of course not. You know, the, if we need a lot more revenue. The question is, what's the best way to get it? Jacking up rates in a dysfunctional, uh, 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 loophole-ridden tax system is the wrong way to do it. It won't work, first of all, and it's grossly unfair. One way, uh, by the way, to make sure that the, this audience contributes uh, to the national recovery that we have to have is to close some of those exceptions and exemptions, which are much more used, uh, widely used by people of means. And uh, so it, it, it's, there's both a growth and an equity component to that. In, in looking at you, and I know I'm over here, so I, in, in, in looking at what you have said, you've said a couple of things. Number one, you talk about Social Security and reform in terms of, of increasing the age. And, and also making it so that the wealthy, the wealthiest among us should not receive Social Security benefits. So, so the, idea, the idea is that in some cases uh, the, the wealthy should be treated different. And to treat the wealthy different is not to be engaged in some kind of class warfare. To ask more of them is not to engage in class warfare. No, exactly right. I thought, you know, I, I always have to start with this confession. I, uh, unlike probably everyone sitting here, did not watch one minute of any of the debates. Just, just the Republican debates. Any of the, yeah, right. Well, they've only yeah. been I mean, Republican. There, yeah. There was always, you know. <laughs> well, can I tell you one e thing? ESPN that happened? always had something better on. The <laughs> they ask all the candidates if they could see a ratio of uh, ten. No, no, that's what <laughs> ten dollars in spending and one dollar in revenue would they buy, it and not one would raise their hand. Well, that's what I was getting to because I, I read about them and. And that, as far as I know, was the single most interesting question asked. And somebody should have raised his hand or signaled it, you know, not necessarily to say, I'll take it sight unseen, uh, you know, tell me more. Are the spending cuts real or are they phony baloney like Washington's known for? Uh, if you posit that they're real, if, uh, you know, what kind of revenues? If it comes from the kind of reform you and I just mentioned, Deductions. bring that on. If it, you know, so someone should have at least have said, Tell me more. You know, my, my attitude toward this whole thing has been, 
uh, if, if, you, if somebody should want to know what I think is the best way to ad address this, I've laid it all out there a bunch of times, but here's the deal. Um, having told you what my first set of choices would be, if we can't do that, let's talk about second choice or third choice because, um, you know, I do not uh, choose, I would not, li I would not like to stand in the wreckage of our republic saying, I told you so and you should have done it my way. You're basically saying don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Yes, sir. Right? Uh, you also said the following, uh, you, the philosophy is never take a dollar without a very legitimate purpose for it, which is part of the philosophy. So we've got this fiscal clip, and this is my last question. We've got this fiscal clip coming up, and we've got the question of, of a new debt extension, and we've got uh, the Bush tax cuts. Do you think there is the political will now or in the future in Washington to do this? Well, I, tr I choose to believe the answer is yes. Uh, I'm just going to broaden the, the, the uh, answer slightly. I believe the will is there, or it is latent at least, in the American people to make the decisions we have to make to not do a terrible injustice to our progeny and uh, to, uh, to not undo this beautiful experiment in self-government that America gave to the world. Um, I, and therefore, I believe that if our candidates this fall, each in his own way, would, would simply lay out specifically uh, what they, what they uh, would do to take us uh, out of the terrible corner we're in, that the American people would respond positively to that. And um, that that's the kind of, of um, d debate they deserve to have and that our candidates are, are, are each, would, are, are many of our current um, office holders, let's broaden it, are selling the American people short when they believe um, that, uh, that it's simply they a political debate. They do debt not end. want to be told reality. The, the debates come a long way, Charlie. Thanks, thanks Erskine Bowles. Thanks, Simpson. Thanks a lot of people. Thanks, Paul Ryan. Things that were supposed to be third rail, can't mention them subjects, even a year and a half or two years ago, are now in the debate. So it's not moving fast enough to suit me, but people are talking about the right questions. We do have to save the safety net. The enemies of the safety net are the people who say, just leave it alone. It's going to implode, folks, and that's not responsible if you really care about low-income people. You can, when I say to people in my home state, why are we sending Bill Gates, going to send Bill Gates a pension check? Why are we going to pay for Warren, Warren Buffett's health care? That's not a hard point to make, and they grasp the need for change, and let's get on with it. Thank you very much. Mitch Daniels.